So Lord, we trust ourselves to you. We pray that you open up our hearts to your word. I pray that Lord, you grant me our trust. Be glorified in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me begin with a question. What kind of church community would you want to live in? Option A, a community that is characterized by service to each other, where others take your sensibilities seriously, where people treat you as full members of this community. Option B, a community character, characterized by passing judgment on one another, where your views are looked down upon, where your conscience is constantly being hurt. I think it's quite clear what is desirable. Option A is full of life, it's beautiful, it's uplifting. Option B is suffocating, it's demoralizing, it's tame. As clear as the options are in the Church of Rome, they appear to have chosen the second. The church in Rome appeared to be caving in on itself. 14 verse 1, Paul says, It was a church full of quarreling and disputing. Verse 10, Paul says, in 14 verse 10, Paul says, They were judging one another. So he says, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? Judging one another, treating others with contempt. What was the situation that has led to such a dynamic in the church community? <coughs> it was a dispute between two groups you heard in the reading, the weak on the one hand and the strong on the other hand. They were quarreling, Paul brings out three main issues over food, over the Sabbath and over drink. So 14 verse 2, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Verse 5, one person considers one day more sacred than the other, the other considers all days alike. Verse 21, chapter 14, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do any else, anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. The dispute between the weak and the strong is not an issue of the weak being more susceptible to temptation and always falling, while the strong were more mature Christians. No, they were all trying to answer one question, and this is the question. Now that I have come to believe in Jesus, what does my faith in Jesus allows me to do or prohibits me from doing? They were thinking about this question in relation to the purity laws in the Old Testament. So the weak on the one hand says, so both of them believe in Jesus, they are committed Christians in a sense. The weak says, no, I think my faith in Jesus does not allow me to eat meat. I think my faith in Jesus allows me to treat this, um, the Sabbath as a special day. I think my faith in Jesus does not allow me to drink. The strong take the opposite views. And it's quite interesting what Paul says here. He calls these things in verse 1 disputable issues. It's important. Paul does not say that these are disputable in a sense that they are, the scripture is undecisive. Remember in the reading, in 14, verse 14, Paul said, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. In 15, verse 1, Paul says, look at the pronoun he uses, we who are strong. So it appears Paul identifies with the strong. Yet in this situation, what does he say? Accept one another. 
So the reason he gives this directive is that the issues over which the people were disputing were secondary issues. The issues over which the church was fighting was not basic to the faith. Paul had a position. He sided with the strong. But he said, because these things are not fundamental to the faith, church and Rome are set one. Over issues which are not essential to our faith, Paul says we should accept each other. Paul is not saying that we should merely tolerate one another. You know, when you go to um, the shop and the, 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 the shop assistant is being unkind, what you do is you tolerate the person. You just buy what you want to buy and then leave. When you're on the road and the bus drivers, they are being unkind, not stopping for you, just behind you, speeding all across, you bear with them, you put up with them. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that over issues which are disputable, we should accept one another, we should treat each other as equal members of the community. We should receive each other in intimate fellowship over issues which are disputable. What are some of the examples of disputable issues in our time? And one author that I read said, Baptism, the issue of the gifts of the Spirit, things about perhaps church government. I think we can add more to it. Perhaps even style of music, <laughs> style of preaching, politics. I don't know what you will add or remove from this list. But the principle is clear. Over issues which are not basic to the faith, which are not central to our commitment to Jesus, Paul says, let's live in harmony. Let's accept one another. Our sermon is based on uh, chapter 15 from verse 7 to 13. Here, Paul is concluding the discussion he has begun in chapter 14. He is concluding with giving us the rationale and motivation to accept one another. How can we, as Christ Church in Pine Town, accept one another? The first point, Paul says, 15, sorry, yeah, 15, 7, 8. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you. The fact of the acceptance we have received in Christ is motivation for us to also do likewise. Listen to how Paul described humanity in chapter 3 from verse 9 to 18. He said, let me read from verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouth are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the description of all humanity, Jews and Gentiles, everyone without exception. This is the stock of humanity all of us came from. We did not see God. Do you remember this about yourself? Some of us remember, we saw drugs, we saw pleasure, we saw power. Our tongues practice deceits. 
how we power that lie upon lie to cover up lies. The way of peace we did not know. How divisive we were. How by our words we have broken up with our families. How by our words we have crushed people. Consequently, Paul says in 1 verse 18, the wrath of God was being, is being revealed against all the godliness of men. Because of our sinfulness, we were under God's wrath. But Paul says, our sinfulness and God's wrath upon us was not the end of the story. In 3 verse 21 he says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came Jesus. In chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Paul said, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. In 5, verse 8, Paul told us, but God demonstrates his own love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In 9, um, 5, 9 to 11, Paul continues, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of a son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? The good news of the acceptance we have received in Jesus. Our wickedness, our sin, our rebellion to God was not the end. The wrath of God was not the end. We have been accepted. We who were God's enemies in arms are now at peace with God. 1914, 1914, the early stages of World War I. Something happened on one of the days. Soldiers <coughs> who were fighting against one another, killing one another. Before the war ended, the early stages of the war, decided to put their guns down. What did they do? They come to the no, man land, um, no man's land, play football and exchange gifts. What was the issue? It was because it was Christmas Day. The tradition of Christmas was powerful and motivation for soldiers in arms to lay down their weapons and be at peace with one another. Now Paul is saying, the experience of God's acceptance should be a more powerful motivation for us to treat one another as brothers and sisters. If Jesus gave, us, gave up his life to accept us, Paul is saying, we should be willing to give up our preferences to accept one another. So there's a challenge here. How well do you remember the acceptance of God? How well do you remember that you have been accepted? To the degree that you remember that Christ has accepted you, to that same degree, you will be willing to accept other Christians over non-essential issues. Before I move to the next one, this is important for me to also add this. 
if you have not made a commitment to Jesus, see what you are rejecting. The acceptance that he knows. Your sin is not a problem. It's what qualifies you to receive this acceptance. If you would only repent and believe, Jesus accepts you. This is the Christian faith. You do not do things for God to accept you. You do not become acceptable before He accepts you. You come to the foot of the cross and He accepts you. The second point Paul says in 7b, now we're back in chapter 15. Accept one another to bring praise to God. Or accept one another in order to glorify God. The nature of the problem they were facing in Rome had caught the division to be along ethnic lines. So the weak predominantly were Jewish Christians given their history, given all that they thought about the law, how they become Christians, they were still quite hesitant to just let go. And the strong were Gentiles. They had nothing to do with the laws of Moses. So Sabbath, eating, drinking, it wasn't an issue for them. They, were, they, they knew their liberty in Christ and they were exercising it. But the Jews, they were unsure about their liberty in Christ. So, it, so in some way, they were captive. Mm -hmm. Now Paul reminds the church that Christ's work was to unite both Jews and Gentiles with the view of worship. Mm -hmm. So from verse 9, he quotes from all the parts of scripture. He quotes from the writings, 9b and in verse 11. He quotes from the law in verse 10. He quotes from the prophets in verse 12. Paul is showing that the whole of scripture as they had then points to this one thing. God uniting both Jews and Gentiles with the view of worship. The inclusion of Gentiles with Jews in the praise of God has always been God's purpose, has always been an integral part of God's plan of salvation. Paul gives the vision of salvation history to address this issue in Rome. Um, last week, Bishop Bell reminded us that God is bigger than we think. Reading this passage, it hit me that the local church is bigger than I think. They were facing, it was a, an issue in the local church but Paul addresses the issue with the backdrop of God's salvation history. You see that from verse 9 to verse 12, the theme of praise, praise, praise. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praise of your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people extol him. Praise, praise, praise. God's plan of salvation has the view of his glory, the view, the goal of his praise. In Romans chapter 1, 21 to 23, Paul told us, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. 
The pro our problem in the past was that we were exchanging God's glory. So now in Paul relating the unity of the church with the glory of God, Paul is perhaps hinting that the church in Rome, in refusing to accept one another over, over non-essentials, they were relating to their liberties and their preferences in a way, unfortunately, in the way they ought to relate to God. They were not glorifying God. They were holding on to their liberties and their preferences at the expense of praising God. In accepting one another, that is how we bring glory to God. That is how we glorify God as He deserves to be glorified. Accept one another to bring praise to God. Yes, indeed, when we accept one another, there will be peace. Things will run well. Yes, indeed, when we accept one another, we, we can enjoy each another's company. Yes, indeed, there are so many pragmatic reasons for accepting one another. But now Paul gives us the ultimate goal, the ultimate reason, the praise and the glory of God. And I think this is important to remember that as we accept one another, we are bringing praise to God. And this is the reason. In certain cases, when you subvert your liberties for the interest of others, for the conscience of others, it's not always visible. People do not always see the sacrifices you are making in order to accommodate other Christians. So they get to a time when the temptation is to want to insist on your interest, to also press on for your preferences, to also say that, yes, I have liberties and I'm going to cash in on it. But Paul wants to remind us of this. When you are giving up your liberties, when you are accommodating others for the sake of the gospel, you are not doing it in a small thing. You are pursuing the purpose of God in salvation. So let this motivate you. Do not give up. When there's temptation for you to insist on your rights, Paul wants us to remember this. You are glorifying God in accommodating to the conscience of other Christians. Press on. Don't give up. People might not see it and praise you, but Paul is reminding us you are glorifying God. You are praising God. You are honoring God. You are not doing something small or insignificant. You are fulfilling God's goal. Keep on. The last thing Paul tells us from this passage accept one another by prayer. This point will sound strange. But we have to observe this. In dealing with the issue from chapter 14, Paul has been instructing the church. Paul has been telling the weak and the strong what they ought to do. In chapter 14, verse 3, Paul tells them, chapter 14, verse 13, Paul says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Paul is saying, make up your mind. It's not something that is just going to happen. It's something that needs conscious and deliberate effort. Make up your mind. In 19, Paul says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Make every effort. Some things might come easily to you. Paul is saying, 
not accept one another. You would have to apply yourself. You would have to be intentional and conscious to pursue this lifestyle. Accepting one another, doing things which lead to peace, is something the church should consciously pursue. But in verse 13, notes, do you see the change in style there? In verse 13, Paul moves from exhortation to benediction. He moves from a change in telling the church what they ought to do to appealing to God to do what he expects the church to do. In verse 17, Paul has, chapter 14, verse 17, Paul has told us that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but it's a matter of righteousness, it's a matter of peace, it's a matter of joy. These are things Paul will want the church to pursue. And what we read in verse, chapter 15, verse 13, Paul was telling the church to pursue peace. But we see that as Paul is concluding this session, what he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Paul is moving from exhortation to benediction. Moving from admonition to an appeal. What he wants the church to do, now we ask God to do it within them. If we will succeed in accepting one another of our non-essential issues, we must follow the example of Paul also here. We should appeal to God. Yes, we ought to apply ourselves for our nature, but Paul also wants to remind us, it's not just left to our own efforts. Appeal to God. If we will turn to each other, we will be able to turn to each other in acceptance. We should also be turning to God in prayer. Let's appeal to God. If we don't, we will lose heart very soon. If we don't, we will run out of steam very soon. Paul wants the church to pursue peace, to live in a way that is, is reflective of the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom, joy. But now, the God of hope is the one who is going to do it. Let's make this an issue of prayer. If we can turn to each other in embrace, let's get on our knees in petition. Pray. Pray. Paul has lots more to say. Paul continues for, um, from chapter 14 and he goes on to chapter 16. Paul has lots more to say. But in concluding this admonition, trying to address this issue, Paul's last word is a word of benediction. We ought to pray. As I close, one question this passage raises for us is this. How important is the gospel to us? The reason Paul is calling upon the church to lead the way we want to lead is because of the gospel. His appeal is grounded in the gospel. In Romans from chapter 1 to chapter 11, Paul has been explaining the gospel to them. From chapter 12, he's now bringing the implication of the gospel. And now Paul is bringing to bear in the struggles of the local church what the gospel should do, how the gospel should affect them in dealing with this issue. <coughs> Paul is trying to say, guys, the gospel is so important that over non-essential issues, we have to embrace each other. And I think this is important for us as a church because there are going to come moments when we ought to divide when the gospel is at stake. 
But if we don't learn to unite over non-essential issues, even when we divide over gospel issues, that will be what we to do. People will just say, we are just crying wolf. So the question is not what kind of community would you experience? The question is this, how important is the gospel to you? For the sake of the gospel, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity, shall we pray? God of hope, we pray that you will fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.